legal authority. Um, it was in fact uh, a, um, uh, an activist um, um, group uh, outside the, the existing, you know, it was a, an, an, an agitation, it was, it was, it was a, a group of what would be currently known and even then known as agitators. They were agitating for land reform. So they, they were a militant group in the sense that the action that they took was very direct. It wasn't just making speeches and writing books. They took very um, direct and very effective action in the form of the boycott. And I'll explain the boycott to you if you like real quick. It's nine o'clock. Um, but I just want to but real quick the fast forward. In have said, you know, so now who will we pay the rents to? Uh, well, that was an illustration of how in incredibly um, that incident took place in Bohola, in County Mayo, and I'll tell you it, it was it was it was an anecdote that was recorded by Michael David in his writings to illustrate how incredibly downtrodden the tenant farmer had become. When after a speech that Michael gave, Michael was an MP um, and great speaker of course and very passionate speaker because he came from straight not four or five miles away from Bohola where he gave this, but he spoke, you know, he was a frequent speaker all around the area. Um, and a farmer came up to him and he says, but Mr. David, if we get rid of the landlords, who are we going to pay our rent to? Mm -hmm. He almost despaired. Mm -hmm. You know, so Michael retold that story and just to illustrate how incredibly downtrodden they'd become. The concept of them ever actually owning land and not having to tip the hat and bend the knee to the landlord just hadn't gotten through to them. But nevertheless, but if he hadn't done what he did, he would never have gotten through. So it shows that he did with the aid of a very great man that often gets forgotten, and that was James Daly, the owner of the local newspaper. So it shows you how important the Copleys of the time back there actually still are. So James Daly, uh, and the newspapers were very widely read, uh, often by somebody who read to a, a family audience, but nevertheless were very widely read. So the people were very well informed. So the ideas that were spreading were spreading very, very rapidly and very um, effectively. But <clears throat> uh, nevertheless, they did rise out of that. Maybe not that generation, but certainly their following generation. That would have been in the 18, perhaps 1880s, that incident would have taken place. So that there was a good deal of progression uh, later on. And then there was various land acts, and the most important being the Wyndham Act, and I think it was 1604 or 5 or 6, somewhere in there, was it 03? It was very early in the, um, in the that was the most uh, important one, but there were several others. And I want to very quickly f fast forward through what really happened. As it was clear to the British government that the old landlord days were really finished. Uh, it just wasn't, they weren't there. Well, because of the economy, really, um, they were coming back to England, selling out, they, old landlords were, those that actually ever were in Ireland, or they're more likely their agents, like uh, Boycott. Boycott actually didn't own the land. He was managing the land, and uh, he owned, he, he had a tenancy of the land. Um, but he was he owned, he managed a larger hunk of land and he had that particular little portion for himself. Um, for those maintenance, as they, the word maintenance was the word they would use for that. Um, so they were coming back in droves, just like they had in the middle, the early part of Elizabeth's reign, uh, when they were coming back from Cork and um, the East Coast in great droves and in great distress. So they were now bailing out and coming back to, uh, to England. And so it was clear that um, it was an unsustainable economy anymore. So they started to look for ways of uh, moving ownership into the, um, 
to the, to the tenants of the land. So there was various land acts passed, and the British set up a thing called the Land Commission, which the new free state actually continued. And um, it was the bureaucracy, if you like, the administration of how all of this took place. It was an incredibly complicated and also very contentious process that went on for several decades, starting in the early first couple of decades of the 20th century and running right up into literally modern times, certainly into the 50s. And I personally have tried to get uh, records from the Irish government, the Irish Department of Lands, on the Land Commission, and they will not issue, they will not, um, they will not give any of that information to the public. And they say that it's because there's still wounds, if you like, uh, enough generations haven't gone by, because there was an awful lot of charges of favoritism. You can imagine when there's a big change going on like this, and a, a bureaucracy, which often is recruited from a location, a local area, will tend to have people in there who take advantage and whose relatives get a larger share than, than others. So there was, there was a tremendous amount of um, unhappiness generated throughout the period. But if you ignore that for a moment, there, the, over uh, uh, the first half of the 20th century, um, there was a tremendous um, uh, re-entitlement of land and people who had become bin tenants became owners. So it, it really is an amazing story how the land ownership uh, did, well, the, 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 peop the, the people who worked those small little farms on the west of Ireland, probably their ancestors go all the way back to literally thousands of years. And it's wonderful to, th to see some of those names, O'Connors and the various people, still there, still on those pieces of land, that without doubt go back into the uh, pre way pre-Christian times. And they have a consciousness of that. They really do. So that's a nice note to end on. So there. <laughs>